triumphal entry. For first off, we need to understand that this triumphal entry that we're talking about, it is happening just before Passover. So there's Passover that is coming up. And Jesus enters into Jerusalem. When Passover is happening, he is someplace else. We're going to find out where he is in a moment. Is you need to understand the context. Is that in Jerusalem there were Jewish foreigners that were coming. Why were the Jewish foreigners coming to Jerusalem? For Passover. They were going to participate in Passover. And they lived outside of Jerusalem. They could live any place. So you had Jewish foreigners coming in. Did all those Jewish foreigners know about Jesus? No. They all didn't know about Jesus, so they're there. Then there's the local Jews. The local Jews, those were truly Jewish individuals that were practicing Judaism. Did some of them probably know about Jesus? Yes. Absolutely. I'm sure that the talk was around about Jesus. Then there are the followers of Christ. They exactly knew who Jesus was. And then there was the pagans. There were those who were there. There was the, 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 the Hellenistic Jews. There was the Hellenistic Jews were Greek Jews. Then there was the actual pagans. There was the Romans. There was all the different people there. All these different people were there during the time of Passover. Some are going to participate it. Some are not going to participate it. But they're all there. Some of them knew Jesus. Some of them didn't know Jesus. So here's the context. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at three different passages of Scripture. They're long passages. But we're going to look at the story of Jesus coming in. So the first one we're going to look at is Luke 19, verses 29 to 44. So verse 29, when he approached Bethany and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go to the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat on. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. Stop right there for a second. What did they do? They did what Jesus told them. Didn't they? He said, Get a colt, get a donkey that hasn't been ridden on before. If you understand the context, it's a donkey that hasn't been ridden on before. Get it. And the people are probably going to say, What are you doing taking my donkey? What's going on? And he says, tell them the Lord needs of it. And they're sure hoping that people know who the Lord is. Because if they don't know who the Lord is, they're liable to do what? You get pretty ticked off and turn around and harm them, right? So they did what Jesus did, said, and when you do what Jesus says, what happens? It works. It works. Oh, what an amazing philosophy. That could be a sermon. But we'll skip that sermon for now. So they, uh, verse 35, they brought it to Jesus and threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And he was going. They were spreading their coats on the road. And as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You think they were giving Jesus some praise. Wouldn't it be obvious? They're giving some Jesus some praise. They were excited about seeing Jesus. It says that they knew he was the one that did what? Miracles. So they're giving him praise. Verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teach and rebuke your disciples. The Pharisees were who? The Jewish leaders. I call them sometimes the religious right of today. But that's another story in itself. But they were the ones that thought they were better than everybody else. They were the religious folk. They controlled what was going on in the temple worship, everything in Jerusalem. They tell Jesus, you need to rebuke your disciples. You need to tell them to shut up. Verse 40, but Jesus says, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Anybody heard that verse before? The Bible says that if we don't worship God, even creation will worship God. Creation is more likely to worship God than we are. So instead of rebuking them, he says, hey, you guys better worship too, because otherwise the stones are going to do the worship. Verse 41, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Jesus is riding on the colt. He sees Jerusalem. Many show an image of him that he's up high and he's looking down to Jerusalem. And he says that he wept for Jerusalem. He's sad for the city. Why is he sad for the city? Verse 42, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children with you and they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation 
It's pretty obvious that Jesus is saying that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Did, did, did Jerusalem become destroyed? Yes. Yes. Anybody know how? The Roman soldiers. So what happened? They came and they leveled Jerusalem, just like Jesus said it would happen. And he weeps over them. And listen, he tells why. He tells why. Look at that. Verse 44. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. What visitation? The Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, you did not recognize the visitation of your Messiah. You were looking for a Messiah that was different who Jesus was. You're looking for a Messiah that would deliver you from the Roman Empire. You're looking for a Messiah that would become king, that he would take over the throne of Caesar. You were looking for that, and Jesus wasn't that person. He didn't come to be that way. He came on a cult instead. You've got to realize that. Does a, does a king, an emperor, come on a donkey? Who does he come on? A chariot with servants. If nothing else, he rides on a sty, in a beautiful sty, and he, he sits high, not low. And so they didn't recognize the Messiah. And he says, because of that, you're going to be destroyed. Let me tell you something. There are people who do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and they will be destroyed. When Jesus comes to you and he says to you, now's the time of salvation, you say no. He may come again and say, now's the time of salvation, you say no. There's a time where he says no more. And it's the end. What happens then? Destruction follows. Ultimately, eternal hell takes place. Do not miss out the visitation of God. Listen to me. Maybe you've accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Is that all He wants you to do? Just accept Jesus and then live like the devil. If you live like the devil like after you accepted Jesus, you didn't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You maybe accepted Him so He get you out of hell, but you didn't accept Him as your Lord. And I, I say it over and over again, but he has to be Lord and Savior. Don't miss that time of visitation. Matthew 21, verses 6 through 11. This is the same story told by Matthew. Matthew is a different person than Luke. So we have two different stories. And now you're going to see what appears, and I'm not going to take all the time, but you're going to see conflict. They're contradicting each other, so the Bible can't be true. And so I'm going to show you a contradiction here. So we're going to read it. I didn't get to the whole context for the sake of time, but verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Verse 7, and they brought the donkey and the colt. And their coats put on them, and he sat on the coats. Let's stop right there. If it says donkey and colt, there is not one, there is two. In Luke, they said to bring one. So which one is true? Both are true. Different people telling a different version of the same story. Anybody ever seen a car accident? Get three people describing the accident. What are you going to get? Three different stories. Which one is true? All of them, because they're giving their version of what they saw. So he tells them to do it, and here's the difference. If it's a cult, a cult is a baby donkey. Baby donkeys normally do what? Have a mama. Then a mama has to what? Give them milk to feed them. So the concept is, is that you don't bring the colt without the mommy because the colt has to have food. Now it says it puts colts on them. Did, did Jesus straddle two donkeys? No. No. <laughs> okay, so just don't stress it further than where it is. The concept probably was, as a matter of how far they went, in other words, maybe that Jesus rode on the one to get him where he needed to be and then he rode on the other. To, does that make sense? So he rode the mother donkey to then when he came to Jerusalem, he hopped on the baby donkey. I don't know. I wasn't there. I just know that the story here is somehow that if you look at it, you can say it doesn't make sense. You can say it's contradictory. You can say, I wasn't there, and they'll give me a little insight of what was going on. And then you use your brain, and you start thinking about what could have happened. How many know the story isn't how many donkeys he rode? This donkey is that he entered Jerusalem on a donkey in submission humbleness. That's the part of the story. An atheist, an agnostic, a person taking this to God is going to focus on the one part of the message and they're not going to get salvation because they're so worried about what donkey he rode on. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road. Most of the crowd. Who was in the crowd? Before it said it was the disciples were in the crowd. But were there only disciples in the crowd? It's crowds. People respond to crowds, right? So if there's people throwing stuff, how many of some of the crowds may not have been the disciples? And all of a sudden, but there's Jews, they're not followers of Jesus Christ, but when they see Jesus, and they see Jesus, listen, if your eyes are open, listen, he was not coming in his glory. But how many know that there was some that saw his glory? Riding on a donkey. 
because they knew who he was and they knew what he'd done in their life. So they see him on a donkey and they see his glory. Others don't see his glory because they're just seeing a man on a donkey. And all of a sudden, those who maybe were healed, they hadn't accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, but they were healed. They were touched by God. And he comes down and all of a sudden they realize, this is the Messiah. What do they do? They start putting down palm leaves or coats. Why? To give him honor. So it says here, where am I at? It says, hey, most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. They were preparing the ground for them. You would do that for royalty. Verse 9, the crowds going ahead of them, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now you know why I picked the song. I picked the song because it fits in with the message. It says that they said, Hosanna to the highest. And most of them thinking that they're saying, Hallelujah to the highest. What they're saying, you are the Messiah. You're the one that delivers us. Deliver us, Jesus. That's what they're saying when he comes. When they bow down before him, when they throw the, 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 the leaves on the ground, all that they're doing is they're saying, we want to give you honor because you are the Messiah. Verse 10, when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred up saying, who is this? Think about it. He comes on a donkey, kind of hidden, not showing off, humble, but what do the people do? They start praising him, so he can't come in in secret, can he? So he comes in, everybody, then they says, who is this? So you got the Jews who are outside of Jerusalem. They're coming for Passover. They didn't know anything. They're maybe 50 miles away. They never heard of Jesus. He never did any ministry in the area. But they, Jesus comes along and they say, who is this? What do people start saying? Verse 11, the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And then what do we know they probably started doing? Start praising, talking about it. Start saying, you know what? I was blind, but now I can see. I had a disease and nobody could heal me of the disease. No doctor could heal me. Nothing. Anybody, all these magical magicians, they did their work. They did their sorcery and everything else. But when Jesus just touched the hem of my garment, I was healed. So they're talking about Jesus. So there's two versions. We're going to go to one more. John. John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. On the next day, the large crowd had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the patches of the palm trees, went out to meet him, and began to shout, Hosanna. So these are those who came to the feast. If they came to the feast, the feast is the feast of Passover. If they came to the feast, it would be those in the city, outside the city. So some outside the city came to the feast and they heard Jesus coming. They said, Hosanna. Who were these people? If they came outside the city and they know who he is and they're praising him, who were they? They were probably people who would have been touched by Jesus' ministry outside Jerusalem. Have you been touched by Jesus? Do you give him praise? These people are touched by Jesus, and when they see him, they know what's going on. He may be on a donkey, but they know that he's entering Jerusalem. They know something's going on. The sad part, what do most of them think? When he's coming in on that donkey, and he's coming there, and they're bowing down to him, most think of that know that he must be the Messiah. What are they thinking? If he's the Messiah, they're praising him, and what are they thinking? He's going to take what? The throne of Caesar. He's going to be in charge. All this oppression of the, 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 the Greeks against the Jews is all going to go away now. Jesus is going to come into his glory. Jesus is going to fix everything. That's what they're all thinking. They're excited. How many tell, how many tell you that, what if I tell you that there are Christians who think what? I accept Jesus and he's going to fix everything. Does he always fix everything? No. What if I tell you some things don't need fixed? What if I tell you some things need to get worse before they get fixed? Because sometimes he has to let things get worse so that you will really come to him as Lord and Savior. Because some people want Jesus as Santa Claus. You know what? He just gives presents. So they were saying that who he is. They're declaring who he is. They're giving him praise. He's the king of Israel. In verse 13, Jesus, fine young donkey, sat on it as it is written. Verse 15, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. You know what Jesus wrote on a donkey? Because the Bible said the Messiah would ride on a donkey. He was fulfilling prophecy. He had to ride on a donkey. Why did he have to ride on a donkey? Because it prophesied the Messiah would come on a donkey. So Jesus did what? Came on a donkey. Why? Because he's the Messiah. He fulfilled the prophecy. Verse 16. These days his disciples did not understand at first. Guess what? They didn't know why he did it. They had no idea why they did it. Isn't it amazing? They know nothing, but they become part of the prophecy. 
They know nothing, but they fulfill prophecy. Do you know that you can know nothing about what God's going to do in the future, but God can use you to fulfill the future? Amen. I want you to think about this. Jesus decides that Rich Dover is going to get saved, and he's going to get saved in 1979, and he's going to do it in a Denny's restaurant. Did I know that? I didn't know that. The, the pastor who used to be a pastor became an Amway salesman and no longer a pastor. Did he know he was going to sit in a Denny's restaurant and, and share Jesus with me? He didn't know that. What about the guy that worked at Safeway that's the produce clerk that used to talk about Jesus all the time with me and he plants the seeds of my life and gives me a book that changes my life? Did he know that I was going to accept Jesus in the Denny's restaurant? No. But guess what? Did God know? And did God use all of them to fulfill what God knew was going to happen? Absolutely. What was their part? Their part was to do what? When God told them to do what they did, they did it. Obedience. They obeyed. They was obedient. What do we miss out on and we don't get to be a part of fulfilling the prophecy of other people's lives because we're not obedient? How about that we walk in obedience? So they walk in obedience and so what happens is they walk in obedience. The next thing that happens, now verse 17 so the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. So guess what happens? Some of the people there are what? Who saw Lazarus raised from the dead. So this is the context. This is the background. Let's go to the key points. Prior to entering Jerusalem, this is what takes place. Here's what happens. Go to the next slide. Zac Zacchaeus, the tax collector, is, is converted. Just before this, he's converted. He's a tax collector. Don't you think that people knew that the tax collector got converted? So that's taking place. What else happens? Jesus heals two men. Just before Jesus comes in, he heals two, mind, two, two blind men. They get healed. Lazarus raised from the dead. How many know some things amazing was happening? What if I said to you that Jesus is on a high right now? He's on a high. He's feeling good. Miracle after miracle is taking place. The people worshiping everything else. You know, I'm being exaggerating. Jesus felt good. But what I'm trying to prove a point. How many know that there's things you do in ministry and it feels good? It just feels good. You're on a high. You feel like, wow, me and the Spirit are one. We're just moving and flowing and everything else. Guess what? I got bad news for you. It doesn't stay that way. We'll find out in a moment. Okay, Jesus humbles himself by what? He humbles himself by coming to town on a, on a donkey colt, not an entourage. Did he have an entourage? Everybody doing? No. He comes on a donkey's doll. What else? Jesus, the crowds of uh, the disciples begin to praise God. They start to praise God. They start to talk about the miracles they've seen. They're really bragging up on Jesus, aren't they? Man, I just got to tell you what Jesus did in my life. Well, I don't know if you were blind or not. Well, here, here's my mom. Let her tell you. So all this is going on. So people are getting up. What? They're getting excited. In the midst of all this going on, they're getting excited. People are drawn into all this getting excited. People are spreading their coats in the road. They're cutting branches of trees. They're worshiping. They're proclaiming Jesus is Lord. He's King of Kings. He's the King of Israel. All that's going on. All sounds exciting, don't it? All exciting. Wow. It's exactly exciting as it could be. Then there's Hosanna. People are saying Hosanna. We talked about what Hosanna means. Hosanna. They all proclaim and they give God glory saying you're the deliverer. You're the deliverer. All this is great news. It's fantastic news. But, next slide. Bad news. Guess what? What happens a day or two later? What happens? He's crucified. Now I want you to think about something. About ready to finish up. If Jesus trusted in what people thought, what would have happened? Because all these people praised him. And if he lives off the praises of people, he's obedient out of the praises of people, what would happen? Because anybody know the rest of the story? What's the rest of the story? Judas betrays him. He's given a false trial. He's whipped. He's beaten. He's crucified. He dies and he's buried. That's a bunch of bad news. And you know what the bad news is? The bad news is that people are fickle. You know what fickle means? They care. They care. Go back and forth. One minute they feel one way, another way they feel another way. These people are praise them. There's a lot of people giving them praise. There's a lot of people worship. There's a lot of people who are healed. That Lazarus is raised from the dead. There's miracle after miracle after miracle. He's speaking life into people. Their lives are being transformed. But then when he goes on trial and he's put on a false trial, and then he's Barabbas and Jesus. 
And Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. But Pilate is scared of the Jews. He wanted the Jews and the Romans to work together so that he could be recognized as a man that kept peace in a place that should be no peace. So he pleased the Pharisees, he pleased everybody. And he says, who should die? And you have all these people that worship Jesus, but what do they do? They say, release Barabbas. When they say, release Barabbas, they then turn around, and he says, who do you want crucified? They don't already say, listen, if all they said is release Barabbas, that'd be one thing. But he says, who do you want crucified? He says, do you want him to be crucified? Pointing at Jesus. And the people shout out, Scripture says, they said, they say, what? Crucify, crucify, crucify. The people that says, Hosanna, deliver us, deliver us, deliver us, says what? Crucify. You cannot trust people to be your identity, to give you hope, to give you encouragement. When people give you open encouragement, hallelujah. But how many know that people backstab too? If Jesus went by what people were, he would be the most depressed, discouraged human being that could ever possibly be because he is betrayed by the very people. Some of them that say crucified, I absolutely believe he had healed them. Absolutely believe that. Why do I say that? Multitudes were healed by him, but did you see anywhere in Scripture where it says, anywhere it says, that the crowd said crucify him, and there was an extra loud crowd that said don't. Does it say that in Scripture? Does it say anything about there was any kind of a loud outcry and that there was a battle going? Was there a war? Was there a fight? Was there a riot? Was there some that turn around and says, No, don't crucify him. And they start fighting the ones. They say, They're those that are saying crucify him. They go smack them. Does it say that? The one is nine. It says that they turn around. Peter, the greatest follower, does what? Denies him three times. And Peter, who walked with them, lived with them, breathed with them. Peter was in the garden with them. If Peter was the one that denied him three times, why would we think that those that got healed were all out there defending Jesus? Now, could there be some? Absolutely. But it says that all the disciples ran. So as I end, guess what? Each of us, by the life we live, show if we're saying Hosanna or not. If we're saying, God, deliver me or not. Each of us, we either can be the bad news or we can be the good news. Listen to me. The only person you can trust and depend upon is Jesus Christ and Him alone. If you're trusting in a wife, she's going to fail you. You're trusting in a husband, she's, he's going to fail you. If you're, if you're trusting in a pastor, I will fail you. If I haven't failed you yet, just give me time. Okay? Every person, yeah, I fail myself at times. Yeah. And so out of it, they're, they're, you, you're giving up. You have to trust in who? Jesus and Him alone. Who are you trusting in? Are you trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Are you trusting Him to be your deliverer? I got delivered a long time ago. Is there more deliverance that needs to take place? I hope so. I hope you know that. We haven't arrived yet. Well, I'm 99% like Jesus. Okay, you're 99.9% .9 like Jesus. There's 0.1% less that is not Jesus. 0.1% is not like Jesus. And if you compare it to Jesus, it's a whole lot, lot like Jesus. Because your major stick isn't your neighbor. Well, if I look at me and Doug, I'm 99.9% .9 like Jesus, and he's not. I might be right about that, but guess what? My major stick is not him. Who is it? God Almighty, Jesus. So my 0.1% that I'm not like Jesus, as far as God's eyes is, is 99.9% .9 not like Jesus. Oh, I'll fall short of the glory of God. Well, now I accept that Jesus, I don't fall short. No, you still fall short. It's just that Jesus is made up for it to get you into heaven. I am righteous in Christ. Am I, am I a sinner or a saint if I accept Christ? I'm a saint according to the word. I'm a saint. But I sometimes act like a sinner. So who are you trusting in? Who are you depend upon? Who is your deliverer in every area of your life? This close in prayer. This is Preacher Rich D. Creating Futures committed to equipping individuals and churches to fulfill the Great Commission, which is the lead of individuals to Christ as their Lord and Savior so that they may have eternal life and discipling them so that they may become devoted followers of Jesus Christ. 
Give us a call at 1-866-WANT-GOD. That is 1-866-WANT-GOD. If you like this video, please click on the link below and subscribe to our Creating Futures channel. To learn about going to heaven, click on the attached video or go to creatingfutures.org. That is creatingfutures.org.